Hello and welcome back to module four on who transfers. So how does the automatic transfer principle work in practice? What does it mean? Who and what transfers to the new employer? In this module, we'll look at who transfers. And in module five, we'll look at what transfers. When there's a TUP transfer, employees' contracts do not terminate, do not end when their employment with the transfer or finishes. Instead, employees automatically transfer from the transferor, the old employer, to the transferee, the new employer, on their existing terms of employment. The employment carries on as if made directly with the transferee, the new employer. Their continuity of employment is preserved. So, for example, if Cleanaway Limited I talked about them, them in uh, module one. If Clean Away Limited buys the whole of Not So Clean's cleaning business, there's a tupy transfer of Not So Clean's employees to Clean Away. The employees' contracts of employment with Not So Clean transfer and continue seamlessly as if they'd been made directly between the employees and Clean Away. Both the employees and their contractual terms automatically transfer. So if Sarah Smith was employed by Not So Clean for three years before the transfer, Sarah Smith will still have three years continuous tra uh, service after the transfer, but with clean away. Even the continuity of service transfers. Now, an important question, who transfers? Regulation 4 of TUPI says that the employees who transfer are employed by the transferor and assigned to the organized grouping of resources or employees that is subject to the relevant transfer, which would otherwise be terminated by the transfer. So it's usually easy to establish the organized grouping of resources or employees in a business sale. In our example, Cleanaway bought the whole of Not So Clean's business. All of Not So Clean's employees are part of the organized grouping of resources which transfers automatically to Cleanaway. But sometimes it might not be quite so easy to tell which employees have transferred. So if only part of a business is sold, disputes can arise about which employee should transfer to the buyer and who stays with the seller. And in this situation, an employment tribunal may have to assess which employees were assigned to the part which was sold. Yes. The same is true in service provision changes, especially if the service is transferred to more than one new contractor. Let's look at the wording of Regulation 4 in a bit more detail. What's an employee for the purposes of TUPI? The definition of employee in TUPI is wider than the definition contained in the Employment Rights Act. They're two separate pieces of legislation. The Employment Rights Act says an employee is someone who works under a contract of employment or apprenticeship. That's straightforward, and it rules out both workers and the genuinely self-employed. But the TUP definition of employee is different. It's in Regulation 2 of TUP, and it says an employee is, quote, any individual who works for another person whether under a contract of service, that means an employment contract, whether under a contract of service or apprenticeship or otherwise, or otherwise. Now, what does that mean? Does it include workers? You've got employees, workers, and the genuinely self-employed. Does TUPI transfer workers? The inclusion of or otherwise, appears to make the definition wider than just traditional employees. Self-employed clearly aren't included, but let's think about workers. For years and years and years, everyone assumed that workers were not included. Me also. And that TUPI only applied to employees. But in late 2019, an employment tribunal, in a case called Dewhurst against Revise Catch and City Sprint, decided that the words or otherwise must mean something and so must add workers to those who transfer under TUPI. Now, an employment tribunal decision isn't binding on future tribunals, and I don't know whether it's being appealed, but I think the decision's almost certainly correct, meaning 
there's a high probability that workers who are assigned to contracts will transfer under TUP in the same way that traditional employees do. What about directors? The definition of employee can include executive directors who are also employees, provided they're assigned to the organised grouping of, of, of resources. Now, a director's role as office holder might change once employed by the transferee, the incoming employer, uh, though, because they won't necessarily be a director of the new company. A director's contract of employment is going to be important in establishing their role in the new business. And even if a director is not considered to be the transferor, the outgoing employer's employee, even if they're not the transferor's employee, they might fall under that wider 2P definition of or otherwise. Now, there's another question. What does employed by the transferor actually mean? The identity of the employer is usually very straightforward, but what if an employee works in the part of the business to be transferred, but is technically employed by a service company or a holding company? Do they transfer? Well, strictly speaking, no. But there are occasions where the courts are prepared to lift the corporate veil, where complicated company structures conceal the reality of an employment relationship. This can happen in a large corporate group where employers are employed by one company but assigned to a different company within the group that transfers. If complicated structures are used to avoid GP, tribunals might be prepared to look beyond which companies named in the employee's contract of employment. So in a case called Duncan Webb against Cooper, the Employment Appeal Tribunal acknowledged that an employee could be treated as assigned to a transferring business if they spend most of their time working in it. And this can be the case even if they're technically employed by another company. It is rare. It is rare. Uh, and tribunals will only be persuaded to lift the corporate veil if the situation is being used as a mechanism to avoid tupi. What about the phrase assigned to the organised grouping? What does that mean? Well, assignment here means permanently assigned rather than temporarily assigned. Whether an assignment is temporary or permanent, like always, depends on the facts and a tribunal will make up its own mind. One of the main factors is the length of the assignment. So in a case called Gale and Northern General Hospital, a student nurse was temporarily assigned to work at a particular hospital for training purposes, and the Court of Appeal said he was not permanently assigned, as he wasn't part of the human stock. What a horrible phrase. Wasn't part of the human stock of the hospital. Now, unhelpfully, courts have consistently refused to give detailed guidance on assignment, on what's temporary or permanent, because they say the facts vary from case to case. So... How much time an individual spends in the part of the business being transferred is relevant, but it's only one factor. So a case called Skill Base Services and King involved a service provision change. And in that case, the, the local authority, the council, had contracted out its housing maintenance to Skill Base. Skill Base had other contracts also. The local authority then brought the housing maintenance back in-house. A dispute arose over which employees would TUPI transfer back in-house under the service provision change provisions uh, back to the council from skill base. One employee spent all his time on the housing maintenance contract. The court of session, that's a, a Scottish appeal court, the court of session agreed that he transferred. But two other employees each said they spent 80%, 80% of their time on the housing maintenance contract. Why did only one of them transfer? Well, the one who transferred spent 80% of his time on the contract. His employment contract related specifically to the performance of the housing maintenance contract. That was enough to be assigned to the housing maintenance contract. The third employee was a manager and in charge of different contracts, including the housing maintenance one. The court wasn't convinced about his assertion that he spent 80% of his time on the housing maintenance contract. He was more of a figurehead 
than a worker on the contract, and he wasn't involved in day-to-day -day operational matters. His employment contract was general in nature, relating to overall company management, and the Court of Session said he wasn't permanently assigned to the housing maintenance contract. And the court said the following things are relevant when considering whether an employee is assigned to a particular section of the business. It listed these. The time spent in one part of the business or another. The value given to each part of the business by the employee. The employee's contractual terms showing what they can be required to do and the internal allocation of cost of the employee's time to different parts of the business. And the key when thinking about this is first to identify the organised grouping of employees, which will transfer, and then decide whether an individual is assigned to that group. So in a case called WGC Services against Oladell, the employees were employed by JKG. JKG. It provided cleaning and housekeeping services to hotels. JKG lost various contracts in relation to 19 hotels. Two area managers had been responsible for those 19 hotels between them. JKG claimed the two managers should transfer to WGC. Wow. LOA. Lots of acronyms. JKG said the two managers should transfer to WGC, which is the company which won the contract for six of the 19 hotels. The employment tribunal said the managers were part of an organised grouping which transferred to WGC, but the employment appeal tribunal disagreed. The tribunal should have looked at each hotel individually and then assessed whether the area managers were assigned to any organised grouping of employees at each hotel. Now, the issue seems complex, but don't despair. In practice, in reality, in almost all cases, you can agree this. Legally, you're not allowed to, but it's what happens in reality. In practice, the transfer raw, the outgoing employer and the transferee, the incoming employer, usually agree a list of employees who will transfer, which in 95% of cases, yeah, I know I've made that figure up, but it's, it's probably about right, in the vast majority of cases, avoids disputes later on down the line. Employees who are absent at the time of the transfer will nevertheless usually transfer. This includes employees on maternity leave or sick leave, even if it's long-term sick leave. What if someone's remained employed only to access permanent health insurance? So if someone's been off sick for many years with no prospect of returning, but has been kept on the books to access permanent health insurance payments, then they won't be assigned to the organised grouping of employees. Employees who are suspended pending disciplinary proceedings will remain assigned to the organised grouping, providing they haven't been removed from it. And if an employee has been deliberately removed from activities following a client instruction, then they won't be assigned and won't transfer. These are just examples of cases decided in the past, but I should emphasise that it all depends on the facts. Even employees who've been temporarily laid off can potentially form part of an organised grouping, provided the group of employees retains its identity as an organised grouping of employees. The length and the reason for the layoff will be relevant. And this principle, this approach, avoids allowing a 2P loophole, which would allow businesses to temporarily lay off staff before a transfer in order to avoid TUPI. The automatic transfer principle applies to anyone employed in the organised grouping of resources immediately before the transfer. It also applies to employees who would have been employed immediately before the transfer if they hadn't been automatically unfairly dismissed, i.e. dismissed in order to stop them transferring or because of the transfer. They, employees who are automatically unfairly dismissed, can pursue a claim against the transferee, the incoming employer, even if they were dismissed before the transfer. 
However, there is an economic, technical or organisational reason defence. It's the fair reason defence in Tupi cases. If there's an economic, technical or organisational reason for the dismissal entailing changes in the workforce, then the employee will not be deemed will not be deemed to have been employed immediately before the transfer and liability for any claims for unfair dismissal or other claims stays with the transferor, the outgoing employer. If an employee is dismissed before the transfer but appeals and is reinstated after the transfer, they are deemed to have been employed at the time of the transfer. That's because the dismissal vanishes, like in other appeal cases. The principle won't apply if an appeal is simply pending before the dismissal. The appeal has to be successful for the dismissal to vanish. Now, employees can't be forced to go and work for somebody they don't want to work for. Just because there's a tupi transfer doesn't mean that employment automatically transfers. Employees can choose who they want to work for. Some employees may not want to work for the transferee. There might be all sorts of reasons why they might not want to work for an incoming organisation. If an employee objects to the transfer, then their employment will not transfer. Their employment terminates on the transfer date, but there's no dismissal. There's no legal dismissal. And that means if they object to the transfer, they're not entitled to any compensation. No unfair dismissal because they haven't been dismissed. No redundancy because they haven't been dismissed on grounds of redundancy. No compensation. It's got to be a clear objection though. Expressions of concern or unwillingness about a proposed transfer might be just an expression of unhappiness rather than an objection. So if someone's expressing unease and disquiet and saying they don't really want to go, you should seek clarification if it's unclear. It's not compulsory to tell employees about their right to object. It's probably best practice to do so together with information about the consequences. But if an employee objects to the transfer, they lose their rights. They don't transfer and they're deemed having just left employment from the transfer raw, the outgoing employer, without having actually been dismissed. In module five, we're going to look at exactly what transfers to the new employer. We're, what are we, almost halfway through the course? Not quite. I hope you're finding it useful. Do email me if you've got any questions. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in module five.